Let us listen reverently. This is God's word. And immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead to him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And after he'd sent the multitudes away, he went up to the mountain by himself to pray. And when it was evening, he was there alone. But the boat was already many stadia away from the land, battered by the waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were frightened, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you in the water. And he said, Come. And Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came toward Jesus. But seeing the wind, he became afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus took, stretched out his hand and took hold of him and said to him, O ye of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind stopped. And those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, You are certainly God's Son. Let's pray. Gracious Lord and Father, as we come to one of many gospel texts concerning our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray for hearts that are eager to know Jesus better, to understand him better, to be more familiar with every truth about Jesus that you have revealed in your holy word. And blessed Savior, we ask you to grant your Spirit's work in our hearts that we will know you well, that we will know you reverently, that we will know you submissively, that we will know you obediently and know you with fervent affection and growing, of growing love for you, blessed Savior, combined with unending thankfulness for what you accomplished even unto the cross, suffering there and dying, being buried and raised from the dead in order to accomplish our redemption. We can't comprehend that fully, but oh, do we thank you for it. And pray this morning that you will refresh us in appreciation for your glorious, redeeming work Father in heaven, I am not equal to this task to do justice to the glory of Christ and ask you to make your strength perfect, Lord Jesus, in my weakness, that in spite of the frailties of what I bring to this time, you will rule and overrule and greatly honor Jesus Christ and greatly glorify Jesus Christ. And we ask this, Father, in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Knowing Jesus. Is that important? Knowing Jesus. It's easy to use the words. It's not so easy to accomplish. I remind you that at the beginning of Christ's public ministry in the first sermon he preached, he warned at the end of that sermon that many would say that in the day of judgment, have we not done thus and so? And he will say, I never knew you. And knowing Christ in a way that is redemptive and blessed is a two-way street. Not only him knowing us personally in a relationship, but we knowing him. And those are inseparable if we are indeed walking with Christ. 
back to the reading earlier from Second Peter 3, the last verse, verse 18 of that little epistle. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I don't believe it's possible to know too much about Jesus. I don't believe it's possible to study too intently about our Redeemer. And I think one of the joys of the worship that God calls us to is that in that worship, one of the elements of it that makes it blessed is unfolding Christ to us that we more and more have a sense of a real relationship with him, not just knowing about him, but knowing him. And so this morning I want to address an aspect of Christ that I don't think we often deal with in our Reformed churches, and that's his miracles. Because his miracles is the way he conducted them, and with what he said in the context of granting those exceptions to ordinary providence are revelatory and that richly. That knowing what he did and why he did it miraculously is a part of knowing Jesus. I don't intend to spend much time on dealing with the definition of Miracles, we can say it's a supernatural act of God outside of his ordinary providential governing of all his creatures and all our actions. And it generally involves something that is clearly not available to ordinary people using ordinary means. So looking at Christ's savingly includes looking at him as a miracle worker, if we may use that word. Turning for a moment to John chapter 10, the great chapter on the Good Shepherd, in verse 14, Jesus said, I am the Good Shepherd, and I know my own, and my own know me. I submit that Understanding the miracles is not an issue of salvation, but it certainly is an issue of sanctification, our growth in grace. So some insights in general, first of all, about Christ and miracles. I will use the word signs and miracles interchangeably. With a few exceptions, they're mostly synonymous in the New Testament, so I trust you will accept that very slight uh, fudging because occasionally there's places where sign is not uh, the uh, meaning of a miracle. But generally they can be used interchangeably. Matthew 12, if you will please. Matthew 12 verse 38. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered him, saying, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. But he answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation craves for a sign, and yet no sign shall be given to it but the sign of Jonah the prophet. So starting as an overview umbrella principle, a desire for signs or miraculous vindications of some question of some sort is wrong. That's sin. God commands us to trust him on the basis of the word, but not because of miracles. Now, we do know that miracles had a number of purposes, and one of the first that's mentioned about Jesus Christ in John, of course, is the miracle at the wedding of Cana in Galilee and turning water into wine. And in verse 11 of that chapter, we're given the clear reading from the inspiration of John writing the gospel. 
this beginning of his signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory. <coughs> manifested his glory. Demonstrated his glory. And his disciples believed in him. So we know that sometimes miracles became an occasion of, un of belief. In John 1 verse 14, we have this reminder at the beginning of that great epistle, of the great gospel, John. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. And of course, that necessarily includes, includes everything that he said and done. Now, back to Matthew for a moment, please, to chapter 9 and verse 35. And Jesus was going about the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, <coughs> proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. And seeing the multitudes, he felt compassion for them, because they were distressed and downcast like sheep without a shepherd. Compassion, merciful regard for those in need. A major driving reason behind Christ's performance of miracles of healing. And I think in studying the Gospels we can say the number is uncountable because it gives us in several places, statements about many healings, but without specifying the actual number. So this was a major part of Christ's public ministry as the Messiah was miraculously healing people. And then we know, as from the text in John chapter 4, or excuse me, John 2, the wedding in Cana in Galilee, that faith was strengthened, but sometimes faith was not brought about by the witnessing of miracles. John chapter 6, please, if you have your Bibles. John 6, verse 2. Reading from the beginning of verse 1. After these things, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, or Tiberias, Verse 2, and a great multitude was following him because they were seeing the signs which he was performing on those who were sick. And then, if you look at verses 26 and 27, Jesus has an insight into this. Verse 26, Jesus answered them and said, Truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. And of course, Jesus Christ, who knew the heart of those to whom he ministered, could infallibly say what was the reason for which they sought, and if you recall, uh, to make him king, actually. But miracles did not necessarily guarantee uh, a belief. And then in John 11, verse 45, which I believe is the record of the most amazing miracle of all, other than his own resurrection that Christ committed, we have this testimony, verse 45, many therefore of the Jews who had come to Mary and beheld what he had done, that he is Christ, of course, believed in him, many, but not all. So the performing of miracles did not guarantee belief. And indeed, miracles had other purposes as well. If you will, turn to John 9, verse 16. Therefore some of the Pharisees were saying, This man is not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath. But others were saying, how can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And there was a division among them. 
So his miracles sometimes were divisive, revealing deep differences of understanding and regard for Christ's signs or miracles. And then there was yet another reason specifically stated that's worthy of note in Luke chapter 5. In Luke 5, beginning with verse 22, we have this insight. But Jesus, aware of their reasoning, that is the reasoning of the scribes and the Pharisees, answered them and said, Why are you reasoning in your hearts? Which is it easier to say, Your sins have been forgiven you? Or to say, Rise and walk? But in order that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, he turns to the paralytic and he says, I say to you, arise, take up your stretcher and go home. Clearly, he performed that miracle in conjunction with his authority, declared authority to forgive sin, which the Pharisees had recognized a connection, albeit corruptly, in their reasoning. And then, of course, uh, we know that uh, the power to raise the dead, which he did as was the son of the widow of Nain, was a powerful sign of his own authority and even in his state of humiliation. Would you turn to Luke 16? In Luke 16, I believe we have a very powerful assist in getting a right theology of the miracles of Christ in a way that's a blessing and not a pitfall. Luke 16, beginning with verse 25. This is the account of the rich man and Lazarus. But Abraham said, child, Remember that during your life you received good things and likewise Lazarus bad things, but now you, he is being comforted here and you are in agony. So this is Abraham speaking to the rich man. And I would remind you that this is the only known instance of a conversation from hell recorded for our instruction and given by the Lord Jesus Christ, the only one who could do such a miracle in a sense or I probably shouldn't call it a miracle, but a sovereign act of revelation. So this is, this is crucial. Verse 27, Then he said, I beg you, Father, that you send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may warn them, lest they also come to this place of torment. But Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. Now here comes one of the most remarkable expressions of the agony of, un, of the arrogance of unbelief. Verse 30, the rich man speaking from hell says, No, Father Abraham. You imagine the presumption of that? Contradicts Abraham speaking for God. No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. And here's what Abraham says. It was recorded by Christ. But he said to them, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded if someone rises from the dead. That's powerful. So that clearly represents from the mouth of Christ himself a hierarchy in which the word of God in all its parts is more powerful in the providence of God and the disposition of God, the administration of God's kingdom, than miracles. That's powerful. And I believe that that rightly understood can diminish one of the most common ways we can sin concerning the knowledge that miracles exist. And that's when people say, 
such things as, well, if I could just see a miracle, then I would believe. And we ought to say categorically, no, absolutely not. That's one of the greatest self-deceptions we can ever buy into. But now, will you go back with me briefly to Matthew 14? Because this miracle of walking on the water has an attendant insight and wisdom from Christ that's, that's remarkable. He sets up this situation by walking at early in the morning, like probably about two or three in the morning, across the Sea of Galilee to the boat where they've been rowing ineffectually against the wind. And when they see him, of course, the response is recorded faithfully. They think it's a ghost. And they cry out in fear. And some translations actually put that screamed out in fear. It's a ghost, is what they yell. But immediately, Jesus speaks to them. And what an expression of his compassion. Take courage, word of encouragement. It is I. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. That's a commandment to the disciples. Peter, the spokesman, ever the one to put himself at the head of the line and speaking for the cluster of apostles, says to him, verse 28, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Do you realize what he's doing? He's commanding Almighty God, the second person of the Trinity, the Son, who has all authority in heaven and earth, he commands him to command Peter to come. He commands Christ to give a command. And Christ didn't consume him with fire. Graciously, mercifully, says to him, after Peter gives Lord this instruction what to do, and not only that, but sets the conditions of the instruction. Command me to walk to you on the water. Christ says, verse 29, come, come. Peter gets out of the boat, and we all know the account. He walks on the water and comes toward Jesus. But in verse 30 is that little word that again and again presents the dark side of an event, the sinful side. But... Seeing the wind. Now consider this for a moment. What's being said there. This is inspired scripture. Beloved, I ask you, can you see the wind? Can you? No. No, you can't. And in fact, Christ early in his public ministry dealt with this when talking to Nicodemus, who came to see him by night, he's saying that the work of the Holy Spirit in causing us to be born again is like the wind. You can see its effects, but you can't see it. So the issue, I think, in putting it that way for us, if we have the eyes to see, is to show how quickly, in the midst of a miracle, in the very midst of it, Peter, and that's us, can take his eyes off Christ and start to focus on secondary evidence of something that's invisible, the wind. Really looking at the effects of the wind. Now, I want to pre press one other point. A lot of the miracles the apostles witnessed, did they not? When Christ would heal somebody man is the withered hand, the blind man. Christ did something and they're around him and they see it. So they participate as observers. And then there's two miracles in which they participated as participants in some measure. And that was the feeding of the 4,000 and the feeding of the 5,000. They handed out the bread and the fish, did they not? So they were in the middle of a miracle that was happening. But this one is probably the most dramatic because it's the most 
supernaturally counterintuitive to walk on water. And Peter's walking on the water and he gets his eyes off Christ and he starts to look down. What a metaphor for us that in the midst of the grace of God delivering us from the pit of hell, from the darkness of unbelief, from the peril of sin and iniquity, we get our eyes off Christ and start to look at circumstances more than we look at the Savior. Well, he begins to sink, and he gives Christ another command. Lord, save me! And the amazing love and grace of Christ continues to be unfolded when Jesus graciously stretches out his hands and takes him and says, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? A rebuke, I think a gentle rebuke really, given the circumstances, but a rebuke nonetheless with a compelling question, why did you doubt? And of course they get into the boat, the wind stops, and the apostles give a great testimony, you are certainly God's son. So it, evidently in that particular instance was used by God to increase their understanding in some measure of Christ's sonship. But turn, please, for a moment to Luke 17. In Luke 17, we have an account of the apostles having an interaction with Christ on the subject of faith. Christ has said two things to them. He said, it's better to have a millstone tied to a rope that's around your neck and to be cast into the depths of the sea than to offend one of these little ones. That's weighty. That's really, no pun intended, a weighty, serious warning. And as if that weren't enough, then he says something that we all know is difficult to do. Verse 3, be on your guard. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. So on two counts, there's a difficulty. The tendency to be reluctant to forgive a brother or sister who sins repeatedly in the same way. And also, the duty to confront that's not a task we like. If anybody tells me he likes confronting people, I am personally persuaded he has a problem. I've been ordained for 50 years, come June, and I've had to confront people countless times, and never once did I look forward to it or enjoy it. Now, maybe that's just my cowardly nature, but I never enjoyed confronting people. It's unpleasant. It's an act of love that's necessary. And then he tells them that um, if this person they've confronted goes through the cycle of sinning and repenting and asking for forgiveness, uh, they've got to forgive them seven times. And this overwhelms them. And that You have that in verse 5 of Luke 17. The apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. That's a plea that comes close to a command in its own right. And Jesus gives a remarkable insight in response to what they've said, what they've asked for. If you had faith, like a mustard seed, you would say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted, be planted in the sea, and it would obey you. If you had faith as big as a seed that's difficult to see without a magnifying glass. Mustard seeds are amongst the smallest seeds known, plant seeds known in biology. And he said, if you have that much, you could say to the tree, be uprooted and cast into the sea. So how much is little? Very, very little indeed. But notice he did not say to Peter, you of no faith. He said, you of little faith. And so we get some idea of what little is from Luke 17. 
and can appreciate the grace of Christ, please God, in his kindness and mercy and forbearance with Peter. But I want to bring this now to a starting point by asking you to turn to three different texts in the Gospels. The first is to John chapter 20. John 20, beginning with verse 24. But Thomas, one of the twelve called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. This is, of course, after the resurrection. Christ had appeared to the other disciples. The other disciples were therefore saying to him, But we have seen the Lord. And all of them are witnessing to Thomas. We have seen the Lord. But, there's that word, always the contrast, the sinful other side of the picture. But, he said to them, unless I see in his hands the imprints of his nails and put my finger into the place of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. That's pretty dogmatic. And after eight days, again the disciples, his disciples were inside and Thomas with them. Jesus came to the doors, having been shut, stood in their midst and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Reach here with your finger. See my hands. Reach here with your hand. And put it in my side. And be not unbelieving, but believing. And of course, Thomas had the grace of God to respond properly. He answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. And then Jesus said, for the rest of time and eternity. Because you have seen me, have you believed? Blessed are they who do not see and yet have believed. Blessed are they who have heard, in other words, the scriptures, who've heard the proclamation of the gospel, who've heard what the witnesses have said about Christ and believed without requiring visual confirmation. Luke 24. Luke 24, beginning with verse 25. This is Christ's comment to the two men on the road to Damascus who had acknowledged their unbelief that Christ was raised from the dead, that the tomb was empty. And he said to them, O foolish men and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? Beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, in other words, it's the Old Testament, the scripture of that day, New Testament hadn't been written yet. He says, Luke tells us, he explained to them the things concerning himself in the scriptures. He considered that more fundamentally important in ministering to the disciples, these two on the road to Damascus, than revealing himself at the front end of their experience instead of at the end of their interaction. Verse 44, again account of him appear appearing and he's asked them for a fish, and he eats a fish in their presence. And then he says to them, These are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to see another miracle. Is that what it says? No. No. He opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and rise again from the dead. Thus it is written that Christ should suffer, rise again from the dead the third day. 
and that repentance for forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. You know about his resurrection. You've been given ample witness to it. That needs to be turned into a passion to proclaim Christ to others that they may be saved. Matthew 24. Verse 35. Heaven and earth will pass away. This is Christ speaking. But my words will not pass away. So I ask you, why do you believe? Because you see a miracle? Because you feel good? Or do you believe, first of all, and primarily, because of the sufficiency of the scriptures? And if Jesus Christ could say, as the sovereign Lord of heaven and earth, could say to the disciples, Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms is sufficient, how much more should we rejoice in the sufficiency and the abundance and the power of the whole Bible, which now has the New Testament, of course, as well as the Old. What a challenge that is to be thankful that we have the best door of opportunity for our faith to grow. And again and again, Jesus Christ, who did perform miracles, who was capable of great works and mighty works, brought us back to what we have in our possession, the scriptures, to be the ground and foundation of our faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for every aspect of Christ's ministry here on earth and the divine record of it. And we ask you for a renewed appreciation of the power and the glory and the sufficiency of your holy word. Forgive us, Lord, when we are of little faith. And we ask you to increase our faith in you and in your Son, Jesus Christ as Lord and Redeemer. We ask you, Heavenly Father, to forgive us for times that we doubt you as Peter doubted you when he was in the middle of a miracle. We ask you, Heavenly Father, to give us such a grounding in your scriptures that our hearts will be inflamed with new and deeper love for you and for Jesus. We pray, Lord Jesus, that as we study you and study you as revealed in your word, our love for you will grow not only because you redeemed us from our sins and saved us from our iniquities, but because you have revealed yourself so that we may know you in significant measure, that we may know you in a, in a relationship that is real and life-changing. We ask you to grant that what we know about you will be life-changing and that anything in our lives that contradict what you have revealed about yourself and what the Spirit has revealed about you, anything that contradicts that, that we will seek your grace, Holy Spirit, to put it aside, to repent of it, to turn from it, and to embrace that which is consistent, Lord Jesus, with your revealed will. We plead this for your glory, the glory of our Father in heaven, and we pray in Christ's name, amen.